My passion for science and wildlife started when I was a child. Um, I love watching science documentaries and wildlife documentaries, but it was very specific what I wanted to see. I wasn't interested in birds, bears, or frogs. I wanted to see lions nailing gazelle. Um, so my father would sit on the living room floor like a gorilla. Me and my brothers and sisters would clamber all over him, and we'd say, Daddy, Daddy, we want to watch the lions. No, you'll have nightmares. Um, no, no, we can, we can watch them. We won't have nightmares. And he'd switch over. And we'd, uh, we'd shout and, uh, and delight with glee until the lion nailed the gazelle. Daddy, Daddy, why aren't the gazelle getting away? I told you, he said with a stern look. Um, but that was my introduction to um, animals of the wild. Um, I never imagined, however, that it would continue into what I'm doing today. Uh, I've had some incredible experiences that have brought me closer to animals in the wild than ever. Kevin has a skunk that's ready for release, and he's kindly offered me the chance to help him out. So what can I expect when we try and put the skunk in the cage? Um, you can expect to be sprayed. Okay. And what's that musk smell like? Uh, it's really hard to explain. There's no other smell like it. You know, it's, you can taste it, you can smell it, you know, you can almost feel it sometimes. It's so powerful. <laughs> so you know when you've been sprayed by a skunk? Definitely. You know when you've been sprayed. Okay. Well, here goes. We're going to move up slow. Yeah. Okay, be aware of where the cage is. The cage is going to be right here, okay? Okay. Now just kind of move up on him real slow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, there's your chance. There you go. Okay, now hold him in there. Hold him like I told you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now put him in the cage. <laughs> there you go. Got him. Oh, oh God, that's <laughs> disgusting. Good job. <laughs> it smells of burning rubber, stale urine, oh, and rotten eggs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dream job, right? Uh, now, that smell didn't leave me for about two weeks. Uh, the crew were uh, laughing their heads off. But actually, the cameraman who was right next to me had um, a better idea of what to wear. Um, that picture reminds me of the phrase, um, always wear protection. Yeah. <laughs> Um, nevertheless, uh, as vile as that smell was, it got me thinking about how incredible animals are and the strategies they, they employ to survive, and also our relationship with them. Um, often we think that we impact on them only, but they have impacted on us and changed us um, in ways that maybe wouldn't, we wouldn't normally realize. And to see one of the first instances of that, we've got to cast our minds back 10,000 years. Humans were nomadic hunter-gatherers. But then something changed. We became agricultural specialists. We learned how to farm. We learned how to cultivate plants like wheat and other grains. So the fact that we're sat here right now in a technologically advanced society, a hustling, bustling city, does come down in part to something as simple as wheat. But plants didn't just change who we are fundamentally as a species, they also gave us one of our greatest love affairs, our love affair with pets. Now, do we have any cat owners in the audience today? Come on, don't be shy, come on, come on. Yay, yay, great. Um, <laughs> now, one of the reasons why we have cats in our homes, domesticated to a large extent, um, comes down to grains like wheat and barley. So we started forming these small village settlements because we were ag agricultural specialists, and undomesticated wild cats realized, ah, those humans, they've got some, they've got some stores of food for us. Mm. That's exactly how they, they spoke out loud. Um, <laughs> uh, and they started moving into our small townships. But it wasn't the grain they were looking out for. They were looking for something amongst it. Rodents, the needles in the haystack, if you will. Too quick and nimble for us to catch, cats made excellent rat hunters and so were welcomed into our societies. Now, um, I don't have any cats myself, but I have had my fair share of uh, close encounters, you might say, of the feline kind. 
I've walked side by side with a cheetah. I've been preyed upon by a lion. And I've even been pounced on by a clouded leopard. They are an enigmatic and beautiful family of animals. But they're also mysterious as well. I'm sure many of us have heard of the phrase or the old wives' tale um, of a cat having nine lives. But could there be something to that saying? Well, in 2001, a group of researchers from the University of North Carolina decided to look into why cats purr. A very simple study, you might think, to you and I. But actually, this is a question that has stumped scientists for decades. And what they found was truly astonishing. They found that the frequency at which cats purr, which is between 20 and 50 hertz, has what's called an osteoregenerative effect. It can repair bones. So after, say, a particularly bad fall, purring was helping the cats to get better quicker. Isn't that incredible? Now, researchers are trying to build on that information and are trying to figure out whether a type of sound therapy can be used to prevent diseases like osteoporosis or strengthen the bones of the elderly or reduce our recovery period if we break our arms or our legs. All that from an animal which has been around us for thousands of years, which made me realize just how much we've yet to learn. We're at the point in human history where we can be fully inspired by the world around us. We can be inspired to create new technologies which we can then put into application. But what applications, you might ask? Well, um, I think many of us would be familiar with shark skin technology. It's used in swimsuits to help swimmers swim faster. Um, I think some people are trying to build on that technology by putting it on the hulls of boats, on the wings of airplanes, and on the chassis of cars to make them more to give them more, less drag even, uh, and make them more efficient. But could there be another use still? One of the things that plague us in hospitals right now are secondary infections from superbugs. Now, what is a superbug? It's a bacteria that's become resistant to antibiotics. The same things that we're using to help fight and kill the bacteria and protect ourselves is actually making those bacteria stronger. So perhaps the key lies in not killing the bacteria at all. Hmm. Where am I going with this? Um, well, scientists that study bacterial growth decided to take a look at a number of animals, and one in particular called the Galapagos shark. It's a very slow-moving animal. So they suspected that it would have a whole host of microbes on its skin, and they wanted to know how it deals with this. But when they took a closer look, they realized there were little to virtually no bacteria on the shark skin. How was it doing this? Um, it turns out it has these structures on its skin, these nano ridges, which make it extremely difficult for the bacteria to stick onto the shark in the first place. Since that discovery, um, a number of companies have managed to copy this nano structure design and are now looking at ways to apply it onto hospital surfaces with the aim of reducing hospital acquired infections. Amazing. All that from an animal that swims gracefully through the water, du -dum, du -dum, minding its own business. Um, but speaking of large bodies of water, what about resources? Can the natural world help us there? Um, one of the resources that all life on this planet need, including us, is water. Now, it may surprise you that 600 million people worldwide still lack access to clean water. Now, of course, we take it for granted because we can just go up to the tap. This is my imaginary tap, just in case you don't know. Open up the tap, and hey, presto, there it is. Um, but it got my mind thinking, how do animals cope with a lack of water? And can they inspire us? Can they help us there? What if I, could, what, what if I told you that we could conjure up water from thin air, and not only that, in one of the hottest environments on the planet. Hmm. During a, a filming trip to the Namib Desert, um, it got me thinking. I could see it seems like a desolate landscape, but there are loads of animals and, and loads of creatures that are able to survive out there. And um, I t turned my attention to uh, the, these beetles that were scurrying along on the sand dunes. They're called Namib beetles. Now, what the Namib Desert lacks in rainfall, it only receives 13 millimeters of rainfall a year, it makes up in a morning fog. 
Now, as this morning fog rolls in over the sand dunes, these tiny Namib beetles scurry up to the top. They put their heads to the ground and lift up their wing scales, and this is where the magic happens. If you look closely at their wing scales, they have these tiny bumps. And around these bumps is a waxy hydrophobic layer. It repels water. So as water starts to condense on the wing scales, it's encouraged to build up on these bumps. Droplets of water start to form, and it runs down the beetle's back and to its mouth, where it can take a drink of water. Incredible. Water out of thin air. This unassuming beetle has inspired designers and inventors to come up with ways of harvesting water from the atmosphere. And not only that, designers have come up with a self-filling water bottle that works much in the same way that the beetle collects its water from condensation from the atmosphere. Incredible. We have so much to learn from the animals and creatures around us. Every time I find out about one of these uh, incredible adaptations, that I, some of which I've spoken to you about today, it makes me say, wow, that's amazing. Wow, that is incredible. Uh, but for me, my, my real wow moment uh, came about 10 years ago when I was at university in my first year. Uh, Dr. Keith Brown um, was talking about scientific uh, pioneers of science, namely a chap called Peyton Roos who in 1910 demonstrated filtrable cell-free transmission of a solid tumor sarcoma to chickens. I'll say that again. Demonstrated filtrable cell-free transmission <laughs> of a solid tumor sarcoma in chickens. Um, all your faces look exactly like mine, but I was probably a bit more confused because it was fresh as week and I'd had a big night out <laughs> the night beforehand. Uh, probably not too wise. Um, sorry, Dr. Brown. Um, but what he was trying to explain, in simple terms, was that a virus could cause cancer in chickens. Hmm. Might not sound like a big deal to you and I, but that knowledge was a game changer in the world of molecular biology. It led to the discovery that viruses could cause cancer in humans, certain skin cancers, liver cancers. Incredible. But what does that mean? Well, the exciting part is we know how to vaccinate against viruses. And this led to the ability to vaccinate against cancer. And actually, as of 2008, uh, there was a national program in the UK to vaccinate against HPV, a virus that calls, causes cervical cancer. A chicken helped us to cure cancer. Isn't that amazing? A chicken. <clears throat> An animal which, like the cat, has been around us for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So if we're only just starting to learn about all this information from animals that are so familiar to us, what about those that are endangered? Today, some of our most iconic animals are on the brink of extinction. The gentle orangutan numbers around 60,000 in the wild. The majestic lion, only 30,000 in the wild. Some species of shark have seen a decline of 80% within a period of 15 years. And poaching could see the rhino completely wiped off the face of the planet within five to 10 years, if not sooner. A harrowing thought. But there is hope. Now more than ever through social media, our voices are more powerful than ever. We can make a stand and preserve this world and this planet, not only for ourselves, but for our generations to come. The animals and plants of this planet will save our lives, but only if we save them first. Thank you.